Hi, Sarah. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming tonight. Um, we're really excited because it's 2024, and we have a whole lineup of new things going on, workshops. We've got a new exhibition this Saturday, so if you're interested in the sneak peek that you have right now, please come by for Adriana Alt's uh, solo exhibition, Levy, and there'll be books for sale, and I believe she'll be signing them, so please come out. Um, for those of you that I don't already know, my name is Sarah Danziger. I'm the Education Program Manager here at CPW, um, and you're here for our weekly artist talk series, Meet the Artist. Um, every week we invite a different visiting or local artist or artists or publishers to come and talk about their work and to share process and kind of peek behind the, uh, the curtain. Uh, tonight we're really excited to be joined by Derek Woods Morrow who is our current artist in residence, but also uh, is actually making up for residency from 2020. Unfortunately, it was uh, derailed due to something that you all know about. Um, so we're really excited that we get to welcome him now. Um, originally from Greensboro, North Carolina, Derek Woods Morrow's work reflects on his experience growing up in Black American South and centers on the exploration of Black sexuality and the complex journey through the discovery Woods, Woods, Morrow practice, Woods Morrow's practice spans photography, film, installation, performance, and sculpture to capture and illustrate the queering of blackness in the spaces in which this takes place. His work has been exhibited at the Whitney Museum of American Art, New York, the Museum of Contemporary Art, Chicago, the Museum of Modern Art, Museum of Contemporary Art, Los Angeles, the Schulz Museum in Berlin, the Contemporary Art Center in New Orleans, uh, the Brooklyn Museum, New York, uh, UIC Gallery 400, among many other institutions across the world. And he has completed residencies at Skowhegan, uh, Bemis Center for Contemporary Art, and Tenna Works, Chicago Artists Coalition, the Fire Island Artist Residency in Acre. Um, if that wasn't all impressive enough, he's the recipient of the Three Arts Camargo Foundation Fellowship, uh, the Rhode Island McCall Johnson Fellowship, the Uprise Grant from the Sundance Film Institute, the Three Arts Gary and Denise Garner Fund Award, and the Artadia Award Chicago, Woods Morrow holds a Schiller Family Assistant Professorship in Race and Art and Design and teaches sculpture, painting, and textiles at the Rhode Island School of Design. He received the Creative Visionary Grant from BADG in 2023. Uh, please give him a warm welcome. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna try not to spill coffee on the laptop. Um, let me make sure my phone is off too. I should have done that before, but I'm pretty bad about these things. I have horrible nerves, so bear with. Um, the resume is cooler than I am. Um, thank you for having me. Uh, as Sarah kind of mentioned, like in 2020, actually March 2020, I was like the first resident. And by March, like late March, they had closed down New York state. Um, and I was like, that sounds great. I'll just like come be in a cabin by myself and talk to no one. And they were like, the grocery stores aren't open. So we derailed, uh, we pushed back. I then moved, ruptured an Achilles and took a position in a different state. So four years later, here we are. Um, I'm on two feet uh, and I'm at RISD. And I'll start by saying, uh, a lot of my work in general, no matter um, what I make, sculpture, textiles, uh, kind of comes out of photographic performance background. And I'm really interested in how like objects and materials encode different types of performances, as well as people, specifically black folks, um, and like inherently perform in their lives. May that be like doing their laundry and then the sort of detritus of that which is lint, then becomes a parts of my sculpture in which many, many performances are encoded and maybe that becomes the frame for a photograph or something like that, or a sculpture. I have mattress sculptures, I do a lot of different types of work and it's always interesting coming to a place that is like so photography driven. In 2020, I was making a lot more um, like flat photography, like 2D wall work. And now I make a lot, uh, a lot more work considering maybe just how we think about images and how they function in our society. Um, and that can really be any type of medium. So thanks for having me. Um, let's start. I thought that wasn't a start. 
Will it let me go? Good, I've got a timer. Okay, so um, also this is like an abridged version of a lecture I'm gonna give at MassArt in, in February. So like any feedback is great because I'm gonna change it and like edit it. And like, I think being and existing is a process. And so um, I often teach from this text. It's like one of the first texts when I think about deconstructing ideas around gender and identity uh, or just identity in general. I'll start with My Gender is Black by Hari Zayat. It was in Afropunk uh, in I think 2016, 2017. And I often begin with like these three quotes, but I'll just start with the one that is the third one, which says, generally for existentialists, one is not born anything. Everything we are is the result of our choices as we build ourselves out of our own resources and those which society gives us um, or allows us to have. And that makes me really consider like who has less resources and who has less access, which also means they may have less access to identity or to access to like just being human or being considered human. Um, and that uh, many of the ideas around what makes a human are completely constructed. And I sort of build from Sylvia Winter's text um, on being humanist praxis often when I'm thinking through what is human and how we came to see certain people as human and dehumanize other people. Um, hey, that's me. Uh, that's me and my grandmother. Um, and another huge portion of my work is really considering sort of a lack of mobility that I sort of inhabit currently. Like as a six, five, 300 pound man who is also black, uh, I feel immobile or at least less immobile than when I was a kid and my grandmother and my mother told me I could be anything like a spaceship. I could be a spaceship. I could be an astronaut, superhero, warrior, uh, and then also an architect or an artist and then also a cook. And I guess if you, as you get older, one of the things I've been navigating is how like oftentimes speculatively people put on me things that I did not ask for. Um, and in many ways makes my body immobile. So even as a photographer, like I'm supposed to stay in a specific lane or as an artist, I should do this or that. Um, in general, I sort of think of my practice as extremely uh, promiscuous. Um, I'm equally kind of promiscuous. Um, and so like even over my Instagram, it says decolonial person in theory and in practice, sexual deviant theorist and artist. Right. And it's something I don't hide like from my from like my teaching practice. I've taught classes on uh, erotics, sexuality, problematics and performance. Right. Like at RISD, um, I teach classes oftentimes around theories about being. So uh, let's just give me some context. Uh, I'm not going to play any video today, um, but this was an interview with on the Terrell show with Chrisette Michelle. And she was really talking about the process of being and becoming. If you don't know who she is, uh, amazing, phenomenal singer who also ended up being the person who uh, sang at Trump's inauguration and in many ways got canceled for that. And I'm really interested in the intersectional ways of being able to either like make a mistake or grow from a mistake or have access to be able to be re rehabilitated and grow from a thing that certain people don't have, like particularly black women in our society. And since in many ways I was raised by black women, I'm oftentimes thinking about them. Um, a lot of my theory, I teach a lot of black feminist theories. So like cornerstones are like Horton Spillers, Audre Lorde, Toni Morrison, Bell Hooks become really important to my thinking. James Baldwin. So here's the other thing I often do is I, I, I make um, lectures in chronological order. Uh, I'm not this time. I'm thinking of life more as like a loop or time that I'm revisiting and also seeing extended into the future. And so this photograph is the most recent photograph. And I imagine by the time we finish, we'll come back to very recent work. Um, this is, I'm gonna explain the work some, but I won't give full details. I actually would prefer people to ask specific questions if they have them. Um, this is 16 frames of me on a cliff on the side of uh, Marseille. Uh, it's the queer beach where a significant amount of uh, black North African and queer migrants go uh, to find community and also to seek leisure. Uh, another interest in my work is like where black people go to rest. <laughs> where are those places? And so through the course of a performance where I basically start at St. Charles and walk through the streets of Marseille uh, to this sort of queer beach, 
Um, the majority of migrants, it's like 17 million people, this is like 2017, go in and out of St. Charles. Um, you go down these steps, I don't know how many it is, maybe 70 steps. Uh, it's gorgeous. On the left is, uh, maybe it's the right. I think on the left is a giant statue that says colonies of Africa. And on the right or the other side says colonies of Asia. And the majority of migrants who don't have a place to be, live, rest, spend time at the bottom of those steps. And so I begin this performance and a lot of my work again, uh, or I, maybe I, I didn't say this, but I'm oftentimes documenting my performances as actual photographs. So I'm doing performative gestures. I'm thinking about how people perform. I'm thinking about rest in this photograph. Uh, what you see in the photograph is the detritus from um, the street. Uh, these are mattresses that people most likely sleep on. Uh, and what happens during a street sweep is they get all pushed into different parts of the city near trash cans. And so as I take this journey where a lot of migrants enter the space and sort of maybe the greater uh, name for this project is, is migration inherently queer, uh, I migrate through the city of Marseille, uh, having North African lineage myself, um, and go to this space. And as I go to this space, I document myself building these small sculptures or large sculptures and my body interacting with those, those, those things. And I'm carrying a piece of, uh, soap. Um, I'm thinking about palm oil too, and palm oil being an export of the Caribbean and colonization. And so I'm carrying this soap with me as I move through the streets, um, in these sort of performances. And then that's my ass. Um, it was, it was thinner and rounder and it was very different. And it, but this is my body mostly now, you know, and like time passes. And I wonder like when we perform who we're performing for, there's like surveillance and there's also surveillance, like a sort of counter way of seeing. Then there's just like looking like valence, just like a flat, like, is it possible for my body to be flattened to just like normal, mundane, black existence? Like I woke up, I worked out, I walked in the living room, thought the light was nice, and I took a photograph, right? Like of that experience, like with the party from the night before on the table. And that's also in my idea, like a sort of activist gesture of actually saying that like, can my body just be like normal? Like it, there were moments, um, this work just exhibited in Chicago and people, would like walk by the window and run away. But like if it was a Venus, a reclining Venus, like no one would say anything, you know? So um, I wrote this letter to my mother too. I said, you raised two queer black boys in the South, taught us the meaning of unconditional love, home cooked meals, and openness to see our bodies as normal. You wake up very early to cook us breakfast or prepare dinner for the evening. I'd smell it in my sleep and wander in the kitchen. You dance about weekend R&B, as your robe would fall open, unbothered, bothered, you would continue to dance from one side of the kitchen to the other. You'd say, it's a body, it's my body. You must learn it, learn to love it and continue making us breakfast, keep providing a home. At the time I'd say, ew, gross, embarrassed. And yet you were actually teaching me to love myself, every curve, every blemish, and for it to be mundane and regular and normal and safe to be a soul, to have a body, to be full of potential. And so another, like, I'm really interested in the potential of people and the potential of objects. And so in this case, just giving a little background to the show and some other context in my work is that I use a lot of weird material. So this is lint spun into rope that is exhibited in many different galleries. Uh, and then eventually what you see on the left in the bottom is that I have deep fried the lint in palm oil and my mother's fried fish recipe. And we'll be making some larger sculptures with that as well. And, I, and I'm and i thinking really about Annika Yi does some deep fried flowers. And I was thinking about that work. And she also talks about her work as um, omnivorous. And I was like, no, I think my work is promiscuous in a way. Um, but it's a way of trying to bring histories together, right? Like the current history of going to black laundromats in Rhode Island, where a significant amount of slaves were brought into the US, right? Where these black people still are or the lineages of those people still are, collecting the lint from these people, the detritus, the labor that has fallen out of their clothes from all the work they've done, and then turning it into something else, right? And not just turning it into something else, bring it into history uh, context with history. So palm oil, again, Expo the Caribbean, French colonialism, um, British colonialism, uh, and then my own lineage of like uh, black women who come from like Mali, 
right? So trying to bring all these histories together and make an object that has that. Um, and then here's this piece. Uh, I'm not gonna show the video. I'm happy to send it to anyone. Uh, I was in Marseille doing the Three Arts Camargo um, residency this summer and had a chance to go to Spain. Uh, this is the Christopher Columbus monument in Spain, uh, at Barcelona. It's, um, he couldn't find the right location even in his death. The, the statue's pointing the wrong direction. It's like not even pointing to where it's supposed to point. And so I was really thinking about the fabricated idea of histories. And so what uh, the video shows is basically a fabricated scaffolding that's built. And then NPCs are non-playable characters from a variety of video games with black folks in them basically take over the monument and just do very mundane things like vacuum, drink water talk to each other. And the video is taken from a vantage point in which actual civilians walk across the video, right? And so you, you sort of get, my idea is that it's sort of blurred, but I also am not trying to hide the fact that it is faux scaffolding. So what happens is there are moments where it purposely glitches, where I let you know that it is fake, that the history is not real. And you'll see that people who walk past, uh, eventually this is an early rendition. So this is me actually stressing my 3D modeler out. He's like, he's stressed. And I'm like, I need this to happen. Maybe we need birds. Da, 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 da. And he's like, I don't know if we need birds. It doesn't have birds. He was right. Um, but eventually these veils cover this monument. And in the center where you see this area, can I come right here? We completely gut this out. And what you see inside of it is basic, basically uh, valence or surveillance footage of me in Marseille each time I go to my balcony for the summertime, when I do yoga, when I eat, if I'm naked, if I'm clothed, if a man comes back, whatever, it's just like my life existing and I'm not being surveilled because it's me watching me. If anything, the Mediterranean is watching me. And I think that potentially that photograph from behind, it's a photograph for the Mediterranean. Um, and so, uh, thank you so much. Um, yeah, we'll skip videos, if it'll let me. There's a way in which, like, in these moments, I'm giving you guys a lot of backstory, but, like, not all of this backstory is in my exhibitions. Like, I do have very interesting labels sometimes. Sometimes the labels say things like uh, s darkened steel or copper, um, cement, and... Uh, the idea of being in the room of a promiscuous black man, like that's in the labels. But in general, like I am not interested in over explaining my work in the work. So I think that comes out of a lot of different contexts, but Edward Glisson is one of these Caribbean scholars who's really like, um, whose theories of archipelagic um, migration and thought and opacities have really like bled into my practice. And I'm not really interested in like uh, being overly transparent or trying to specifically show people something. You'll oftentimes see when I do show photographs that the people's faces are not shown. Um, and it's this idea that like the face allows you to see the person as a human, like the more information you have of the person. That's why the hoodie is such an issue. The hoodie is an issue because you can't see the person, so you can't see them as human. And so I'm often showing the back of people's heads. And that's sort of like gotten deeper and deeper in my practice. Like, I don't know that you walk into that exhibition and know that it's fried lint. Like, you have to do research. People have to do research about things. It is not my job, Black women's job, Black trans folks' job to like tell and explain everything to people, right? And so this is something I've really leaned in into. Here's um, just an exhibition look. What you see is in the top, um, these are basically lint compressed on fences, uh, and then painted in faux indigo dyes from the Americas because like real indigo dye comes from my people, <laughs> like the Berber people. Um, and then, uh, there's a deep fried piece and there's the other piece I just showed. So just giving you some installation shots of the exhibition. Again, images from behind of black folks. Um, and this just closed in Chicago recently. And there's another piece in this show, um, that I'm really proud of and that uh, I've struggled with because there's a there are moments when people have called my work pornographic and I think it's not pornographic. 
I'm often thinking about the economies of the body and how they function and oftentimes how they function unseen. And so here are 16 uh, stills of the Muybridge image compressed into a single image uh, exposed as a semanotype. And you may have never heard of a semanotype because we created a semanotype, which basically is a process in which you collect semen, enrich it with silver and develop photographs in it. I don't, I know a lot of people who have done like, a, a, what am I thinking about here? Like um, made, it's all good. Don't stress. I'm doing enough of that for both of us. But also thinking about like how this is collected, like through my body, like labor that you do not see that I do to collect this sort of specimen. Uh, it takes an immense amount of labor to produce a single one of these images, 150 specimens per each image, right? And so there's a lot of labor you don't see. Equally, the horse has a name. The horse in Muybridge's photographs is named Annie G. We don't know the black rider's name or any information about that person who's become inhumane. We don't know the amount of labor that that person put in and is consistently photographed. Right. And I'm really interested also in how the black body is often seen as a hyper overly sexualized body. Right. So I'm really thinking about how these histories like come in and also thinking about queer communities and the labor we do as like black queer communities. Um, I mentioned horses. Uh, I think horses are like one of the first trophies of colonialism. <laughs> right. Um, it's an inherently it's sort of linked to this sort of mobility or this ability to sort of like further your colonial edge in essence. Um, and so I, I'm making a lot of work with horses too. Uh, this is from an exhibition in Canada um, called Open Structure. The piece is called Good to, it's called Untitled Cowboy. It's very much thinking um, about the Richard Prince uh, photographs and sort of appropriation. Um, it's good to me as I am to you. Um, the, the labels for the work uh, shown in part as an invitation to consider the elusive distance between places, duration, sexuality, pleasure, and maleness. The installation consists of balloons floating in a glass case, a stained weathered rug, the feeling of laying on the ground and staring up, pillows for resting on the ground, and a subwoofer playing Aretha Franklin's Good to Me as I Am to You. And what happens in the video is basically it's a single four minute video that gets slower and slower and slower and slower until the video becomes a photograph, basically. And you get to see the images. And what I'm interested in is if you watch it at normal speed, what you see is like cow black cowboys. It's from the first, uh, it's from a black, the, the first black rodeo that came to Harlem. It's uh, archival footage, uh, 1972 film. Um, and what happens is this thing that I find to be like really erotic. You have like this cowboy, in this animal. And then as it gets slower and slower, you begin to realize it's in Harlem and it's there's, sky, there's skyscrapers and there's like, there's giant street signs and it gets slower and slower and you see kids playing and watching this sort of erotic thing. And you see women kind of excluded, but watching the whole time. And I'm wondering with this sort of work is like, will you take the time to like lay down and like slow yourself and like engage, will you wait for it to get slower and slower so you'll have the capability to see something? Because if you look quick, you easily reduce something. That is the basis of how we, we kind of navigate in this world. And I, I really struggle with that. So I move slowly a lot in my life. Um, I think it's gonna try to play. No, cool. Um, here are some of the images you'll see if you get slower, as it gets slower. Okay, so this brings me to the first exhibition I've ever done that has no photographs, not a single one. Um, it's called Gravity Pleasure Switchback. I'm just gonna describe some of the work because I think about them as photographs in my head in a way. Uh, this, these are glass pieces that um, uh, during the pandemic, uh, a young black man named Rayshar Brooks was murdered at uh, Wendy's for falling asleep. Uh, it escalated with the police and the uh, community burnt down the Wendy's. Uh, I really do wonder if in moments of protest, there's also moments of joy. 
like there's an, a, an overt sadness for the loss of someone. And then there's this ov overt beauty that people came together and agreed that this was an injustice. And so I think of things as having both an interior and exterior sort of way of thinking. Um, and so basically these are glass pieces that have part of that Wendy's inside of them. Uh, built in and what happens when you put this sort of carbon inside of the glass is it begins to break apart and to fracture. And what it actually kind of looks like, if you get closer to them, it looks like what you might think of black people jumping off of slave ships. Looks like detritus breaking apart and floating away inside of glass. And I really didn't want to like go back through the route of navigating this sort of like cathartic visual porn that people see with black people dying and wanted to sort of make it more of a metaphor. Um, and so again, the work is like opaque but there's an immense amount of backstory and it gives that information in the materialist. The, um, the mattress sculpture, uh, two used twin mattresses with subwoofers on the inside, they expand like lungs. Uh, a lot about thinking about breathing underwater and existing and having a place to rest and also how our entire life is encoded in performances that we do not consider. Like you give birth, you die you wake up, you spend the majority of your life on mattresses, but we don't see them as objects that are like worthy of like exhibition or objects that encode 30 years of performance or 10 years of performance. Whenever you get rid of your mattresses, every stain, the time you drop food on it gets encoded in this object. And so I think about these as extended histories that hold um, ideas, moments, and sort of the, the subwoofers on the inside play a specific song. Uh, it's Money Bag Yo, uh, Memphis rapper, uh, it's Me Versus Me. And I'm really thinking about annotation. And so it's sort of annotated in a way that it allows for moments of pause between the breathing of him rapping to himself and the mattresses expand and close, expand and close. Um, and I'm really, I really think about it as like, as photographs as like surface too. And so what's really interesting is like the surface of the mattress will move and the sub of the piece will have this sonic element that you could hear super long, uh, like a super long wavelength or like wide, you could hear it all the way throughout the gallery basically, but you can't, it's not loud. And if you stand in front of, you can feel the sound wave, but you may not necessarily see the wave. And again, this is me thinking about like image theory, photo theory, and even sculpture. Some images. <laughs> um, this is work I often take out, but because this is like a photo place, I wanted to speak to it. Um, the first major piece that I think I did coming out of grad school was I reached out to a childhood friend of mine who was a police officer on the heels of being held at gunpoint in the Chicago back alley for leaving a bar, which I worked at, and it was really traumatic. And I was trying to cope with those feelings of like what would have been, and also reading a lot of Susan Sontag and Roland Barthes and thinking about the gun and the flash and the camera. Also, I had like a camera in my glove box. So it's always like, if I reach for that, like, is that, is that the end? So there's like, there's a lot of thoughts around it. And so I had a childhood friend who was like one of my first boyfriend figures who grew up to be a police officer. And so I reached out to him and said, Hey, can I come and like photograph you? And he said, no, <laughs> for four months. And then one day he said, yes. And so these are, um, I think about red, a lot of my work, uh, the dark room was a place, I played college basketball at a small liberal arts school. The dark room was a place where I found refuge. I would make uh, a lot of photographs, just like after hours by myself, away from my teammates. I was in the closet, you know, it was like a safe space for me. I would invite dudes from apps to come into the dark room. And so like the dark room has always been a very sexual space for me and also this like, just it smells a certain way. Like I love a dark room. I mean, it kind of smells like sulfur. I never want to smell soul for any other time except like in the dark room, you know, but there's something really beautiful about it. Um, and so Polaroid made a stock of a uh, red light Polaroid film that only lasted two years. And so in, I took that with me and we photographed each other. So this is actually Adam photographing me uh, in his house. And I do a lot of work with Polaroid. Uh, there's an accompanying film with this where basically two twin boys um, perform play on a farm. And I had just seen this Claudia Rankin lecture that talked about performative whiteness. We don't talk about that. There's like people of color. We don't talk about people of non-color. 
We just say people of color. So I thought what it would be like to have two white twin boys be stand-ins for me, a black man and a police officer. And over the course of the film, the visuals don't necessarily meet the audio track. The audio track is actually me bathing Adam in a bathtub and asking him and interrogating him and him not interrogating me. So I'm interrogating him and that's, and so the entire conversation is written very similarly to how you would see like police lights on the set of 16 Polaroids. Again, I keep coming back to the movie bridge image. I do a lot of 16s. I do a lot of grids. I'm interested. There's this theorist, uh, Sean Smith at SAIC who had written this piece about the first time movie bridge photographs a black person is when he adds the grid. Previously that'd be shown in a line or a single images. So I'm really interested in like what confines the body when I'm making this work. Um, and then I was thinking about the dark room, like a space of emotional response, uh, a space of considering how we see and come uh, to see light uh, or a way of thinking about like in darkenment over enlightenment. Um, uh, yeah, just thoughts about the dark room. And then Ajamu X is an um, artist who I look at a lot. They make really gorgeous work. Um, Ajamu has this quote that I've been thinking about a lot. Uh, it's emphasizing the non-visual aspects of photography, working in and with the dark in all senses of that word, enables a move from the social body to the material body. That is to say, it allows him to refuse to see the body in terms of representation, but rather in terms of sensation, as something open, leaky, like skin, which is porous. How do we perform in the material body for each other? And I'm thinking a lot about performance in my work. And so I go to a Jamu. And I also go to building community in a way that is really pay it forward. So when I got my position at RISD and I and I was teaching this sort of class power, intimacies, ambiguities, and problematics, it's really important for me to bring black erotic theorists to RISD. So like it was one of the few times where you can get full funding through this Turner grant to bring people who you really value in the community, who the RISD community may not and probably have not ever come into contact with. So I was able to get like Lyle Ashton Harris, Ayanna Moore, Paul Sapuya, Faith Couch, Troy Michi, all of these people to come and further that community. And there's a way in which like I make work that's like in some ways for me, and then I make community projects. And I think it's really important for me to like have both. Like I need my alone time in the studio and my alone time photographing myself sometimes or just carrying a camera uh, like outside. And then I do large sweeping social practice work sometimes as well. And I think I don't feel like I have to do one or the other. I just take the space I need to exist in the world. And like when I'm burnt out by one, I do the other one. Um, here's some of my earlier photographs. So this is like the work I was making in grad school basically. And like, it's interesting to look back almost a decade later and be like, oh, I was really interested in performance then too. And how like the image is obscured and like who's obscuring the, the image. And like, is the, the idea of like the photographic studio inherently like every photographer knows not to take a photograph like this. You know, it's like zoomed in further. The shadows are different. The floor is not dirty, but what is it to construct an image? And I'm using this very specific Grace Jones image which is constructed. She never was in that pose. Her body was chopped up by her white lover and then literally put into that pose and then photoshopped, right? And like, what does it mean for me, a black queer man or a black man to sort of put my body back in that position? Thinking about like massage noir and like how black men also damage trans folks consistently. So I'm always trying to really think about beyond the photograph, how images exist in the world in the sort of context. So when I see images, I'm not looking at just what I see. I know there's a, we see 90 degrees. I know there's 270 in every single image that we do not see. And I try to take that into context when I look at things. I don't think people give me that context as a black man in the world. Uh, yeah, so this was the work that I just showed you goes into an exhibition um, called Keeping Record really thinking about performance again. So this is me photographing Josh, performing for me, performing my childhood in a Chicago back alley, right? And I write this poem that goes with it that talks about a flashlight. He's holding a flashlight. It's about this flashlight my grandmother gave me as a kid to sort of show the way, show me a way. And so what happens in this exhibition, again, is me really trying to extend photographs. There are the images of um, Adam, the police officer, him in a shower, the kind of these, I was allowed in the police station with him. We did a ride along. The film is online, or if you want access to it, I can show you the film, but I'm in the car with him. 
in this process. Um, and one of the other things I didn't mention is like what I'm navigating at the moment is like being a large queer black man trying to navigate my sexual existence and like connect with the childhood that I feel like I had more, more mobility in. And people are like calling it pedophilic kind of. And I'm really struggling with that. Like there's, there's just like a disconnect with me like in that process. So there was something about in the film, it felt really important. We have all this footage of us doing ride alongs, but there's a moment in the film where I'm riding along with Adam and we actually go looking for someone who is a sex offender. And so like that process of being in the car with the police officer felt like a really important moment in the exhibition. And so sometimes my work like really goes there. Like, I'm like, let's really talk about the thing that you're not willing to talk about. Um, the piece is hanging in the middle is a compressed police car hung by an automotive crane. My mother only married mechanics. Uh, I was in mechanic shops my entire life. Uh, so this is like a very, an object I would see a lot as a child. Um, and then basically the city of Chicago gave me a police car for a dollar. They can't give them to you for free. So I had to buy one that had been like, like it didn't even really have an engine. I had to like uh, drag it. <laughs> Um, and then I took the door off of it and, uh, repurposed it. And so that's crayon vinyl and the actual police door sitting on some of the tires. Uh, and it is re sort of vinyl with, um, uh, one that mirrors the 1996 Hot Wheels cars that me and Adam used to play with basically. Um, Thinking about exposure again, like the strobe, one of the things that sort of shocked me during that experience with the police is that I consistently remember being blocked in an alley and the, the spotlight being pointed on me. And so in the exhibition space, much like when a strobe goes off, when people walk by, it illuminates the space. And it's a way of thinking about how people become aware of where they are or like a, a reminder that like you exist in a way. Um, so the whole car doesn't work. And the one thing that works on the car is that spotlight in this exhibition. Um, and then there's another piece that's a wall drawing that's in this, in this exhibition done in my mother's favorite crayons and my favorite crayon colors as a kid. And it's a bit of a community piece. People got to uh, write on the wall. It's like that sort of deviant act that like as a kid you love to do, but you get in a lot of trouble for. Um, and the neon sign which completes one of the sentences in this poem I wrote to my mother um, this is sort of on the hills of like a, a huge awakening of mine. I'm, I'm, I've graduated school and I'm dating this brilliant man uh, who went to Howard, who really kind of changed my life. Like he's the one who gave me the Audre Lorde Library. He's the one who gave me the Toni Morrison Library. And uh, my mother had dated uh, just like black men her entire life and her, she was going through a divorce and he was navigating, uh, he had gone and started dating a white woman. And I remember having this moment when I was dating Quran of like connecting with that experience of like specifically dating Quran, this Jamaican guy and like what that meant to me. So I write my mother a message basically. And the neon sign says we hit white. So it, it's, uh, it's got a very specific um, electronic box in it. And so W E lights up and then H I T lights up and then white lights up and really thinking about the type of violence. And the other type of violence I'm thinking about is the violence of light in photography. So the room is pretty much dark and unless someone walks in or this thing is light is lighting up. So this sort of violence of like, it's a dark space, but then it gets hit by the sort of light that doesn't allow it to just be what it is. Um, just some more images of this piece. Uh, the film was shown in this apparatus that had some of the deconstructed parts from the police car in it as well. As well. And again, that red light comes back as it often does. Um, and it's coming back in the form of when you're in the police car, although on the top of it, the spectrum is red, blue, red, blue, red, blue, red, blue. The red is like all that you see. And so in many times in the exhibition, when the part of the film got to the part where in the police car, you just see red in the room if there's no one in the room. So a bit like a dark room. And so the title of the piece is called The Roach is Coming. Um, I kept thinking about it like in a horror movie when it pans to under the sofa and you know something's about to scare the shit out of you, uh, you know it's like something is gonna happen but a roach just scurries out, like almost a docile thing happens. And I felt like the film was on that edge 
that like inherently everyone thought the film was like this pedophilic, this like thing that I'm, I'm, I'm bathing a cop. And like, actually the film ends like pretty mundane. Like it's a pretty mundane film that is on the edge of tension for the entire time. And so I named it The Roach is Coming. Um, the Roach is Coming. Uh, I used two white twins as stand-ins for Adam and I. Uh, in the salient topic of police violence, it harkens back to moments in horror movies when the camera slows and rolls down a dark closet. We've all seen the horror movies. We know what happens next. In fear, we prepare ourselves and always a roach scurries out. It also seems that we never talk about white performance, about racializing whiteness and about our awareness of it. I can remember being a boy and not knowing that I was black. That came much later when people told me I was black. Much of the roach is coming ask, ask if Adam was the same person he was when he was a five-year-old too, now that he's a 32-year-old cop. Um, a little simbit from it, it's online, feel free to watch. Okay, uh, Karan is, we're no longer together. Um, Karan is here, but it was really impactful to my life. And we used to have this event called Tuesdays where we would just invite black queer people and POCs from the community uh, into our home and we would talk about like financial management, risk taking, sexual health, culture and artistry. And that was a way of creating community that didn't have to be in a white walled gallery or have to be something like specifically um, funded. It was like something that we could do for the community for ourselves. And I often wonder what like artists do in their lives. Like we often have interviews, we're doing studio visits. I'm like, well, what do you do for fun? Like how does that come into your work? I ask that to my students a lot too. Like th there's a way in which you're like, oh, I just read or, oh, I just look at other artists. And I'm like, but like, has Rick and Morty come into your work somehow? Or like the food you ate yesterday, has that come into your work? Or like um, Shanique Smith has this great article and I can't remember the name of the book, but she talks about all our influences and they're like all over the place. And her work is so good because she's influenced by so many things. You know, and so it's really important to sort of think about how as black queer people in Chicago, we could be influenced and learn about so many different aspects of who we were. Um, and that's really a transition for me. Like, I don't really make the police violence work anymore like that. I made it. It happened. I needed to navigate that trauma. And like I moved into a different space completely. Um, and so the next sort of big shift in my practice is when Paul Sapuya um, asked, to include a photograph that we took in their studio for the Whitney Biennial in 2019. And it's really started like really uh, Tuesdays was happening. This happens. And I'm like, what does it mean to be community involved, community informed and be an artist? How does that show up in your practice? Do you want it to show up in your practice? Um, and it's interesting to, uh, again, I'm jumping back and forth throughout time, but like, I don't think if it isn't, not that I'm all that selfish, but if it isn't for Paul doing something like inviting all the photographers that's been in his studio to exhibit in the Whitney Biennial in his place, I don't know that I spend so much time at RISD trying to bring black, like trying to create community in places when I'm given power. Like there, we are circumstances of our situations. And like, I've been in a lot of situations where I've been humbled in which I learned a lot about myself because of the people who are around me. And I really try to pay that forward whenever I can. Um, I try to be kind to everyone, but there's a way in which moments like this, like being a part of this amazing exhibition and being part of a community of queer folks um, really just pushed my practice to consider more how I could engage with community. Um, here's some installation videos. Again, maybe one of these images is Paul. I can't even remember. The majority of them are other photographers who have been in Paul's studio. And then I produced my first film. So um, it's a commission from an organization called Visual AIDS. I was given $2,000. <laughs> I did. I spent that on the camera lens <laughs> so we could shoot the film. <laughs> and then I fed people. Um, basically the, the, I'll read. I'll read. I could I could explain off the top of my head, but in 2017, I met long-term survivor Patrick McCoy, who has become a frequent collaborator collaborator in my practice. My film, Much Handled Things Are Always Soft, 
which was made in 2019, focuses on the impact of the AIDS crisis on the Black queer community. The film offers a dialogue between Patrick McCoy, who has lived through much of the crisis, and myself to act as a bridge between the unwritten and undocumented histories of public sex culture in the South Side of Chicago, uh, and it comes in the context of what is happening uh, there now. And so one of the things was Visual AIDS commissioned um, HIV positive artists to develop uh, eight, eight HIV positive artists to develop work. And I said, hey, I'm not positive. Um, I worked in sexual health. I like have a lot of partners who are positive, but I'm wondering if I could make a film where the order is positive and would be willing to share his story of a history that was written out of history. You have conversations about this in New York. You have conversations about this in San Francisco, but I really wanted to have a conversation about this in Chicago. Um, and so basically Patrick uh, narrates the film and I'm sort of interviewing him and we sort of document this group of um, black folks who are inhabiting the parks. Um, I think often of like, I've always kind of been into like sexy older dudes, but there's, if you're thinking about like a population, like there's just less black queer adults because AIDS disproportionately affected that demographic of people, right? We don't talk about that, you know? And I kept thinking, how can I make a film that paid homage to a history that I wasn't a part of, but also talked about who's there now and how, how this happened. Um, the film takes its title, Much Handled Things Are Always Soft from Sula. There's in this Toni Morrison book, uh, Sula's talking, a young girl, young black girl, she's talking to her grandmother. The mother is sort of absent and considered to be a prostitute. And she goes, uh, she meets her mom for the first time and she's like, oh my God, her skin's so supple. Like she's dressed so nice, she's beautiful. And the grandmother sort of snidely says, well, much handled things are always soft. As if to say like, she's a handled woman. Of course she looks like this, you know? And I kept thinking like, well, is it okay to be handled? <laughs> Like, is it okay to be soft in that way? So that was the name of the film. Um, it was also really important. Moonlight had just won best film of the year. And I'd seen this entire film multiple times. And what angered me the most about it is it's lacked like the satisfaction of an actual sex scene for the black character. I kept thinking, well, I didn't want it to be this pornographic image, but I wonder if like beyond sort of having a masturbatory experience on a, on a beach as a child or like as an adolescent in which that same person beat you in school because someone called that person queer. This is like what happens in the movie. Like, is it possible that at the end of the film, that person actually gets some satisfaction from a black lover? So this might be one of the more pornographic things I've done because cruising, you have sex. And so some of the sexual scenes were actually filmed in this film. And I really thought it was important to show that like black people have sex like together in public, <laughs> you know, it just felt, it felt like really important. Um, equally, we took Patrick, Patrick is sort of an, he'd call himself an amateur photographer. He's a real photographer. He's had exhibitions now. He should have had exhibitions in the past, 70,000 photographs of black queer people, many of whom have died of AIDS and are no longer alive. Um, we sort of gorilla wheat paste on um, the space this is happening in, in is now the University of Chicago's high ropes course. I don't know if you guys know what a low ropes course is these things that like college students do to like team build. They like built a fence around this area that people had been cruising and had been living in for years. And then just like said, we're gonna use it for this now. So of course the cruisers like cut a hole in the fence and go back there and hook up all the time. I don't know how I know, but I know, right? And so uh, it was really um, interesting because you also might not always wanna show Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's, it's hard to like show a community that is inherently a community that is about a lack of sight, right? Because it is a, a hidden culture, right? Um, yeah, thank you so much for coming. Sorry, I'm hitting things. Um, so all of the images are people who actually have passed away. Um, and it's another way for me to think about how I use photographic imagery in my work to not just take photographs, but to use other photographs or use archives in my work. This is what it looked like in winter 2021. 
This is some of the film. Um, I'll just touch on this briefly. The, the work exhibited in pretty much like, um, because of the visual arts sort of programming, like in every major institution in the US, MoMA, Whitney, everywhere. But some of my, the best moments with this is when they meet the community. So like during the process of the pan, uh, during the pandemic, uh, an artist friend of mine who was doing their PhD asked to curate it. Um, it's also in the heels of finding out that my mother's entire lineage is from Mali and we're Turag. And they're doing this, pro, uh, this PhD um, project called Mythical Migrations, which is about uh, people of color, uh, Muslim utopias and queer heritages. And the film gets curated into a cruising uh, bathhouse on the internet where you actually navigate the architecture on the internet. Um, and I thought, wow, that allowed people um, to actually access the work in a place that isn't just in a white walled gallery, which is also really important. Uh, the next thing that happens is I do a contract with Jacked, and Jacked is kind of like Grinder, but it's like for mostly POCs, up to 5 million different POCs, um, queer folks between here and Canada. And it allows me to exhibit the work in the app of Jack. So where people are actually cruising and need the information of the historical context of what AIDS, the AIDS crisis did, it's actually showing to 14,000 people at once over the course, like every hour. You know, and I was like that, it really pushed me to think about how like the gallery space wasn't the only space to show work. That there were other ways for me to curate myself with film around the world. I do performance work as well. Uh, these bricks are from the George Washington Equestrian uh, Memorial Monument in Washington Park, which is where the film was filmed. Uh, these bricks are basically ceramic, um, are then um, refired with sand taken from queer beaches and black beaches from around the US. Some of the sand is from Lincoln Beach. I, I literally excavate beaches and drive them across the country uh, from Fire Island, from all these different places. And then they basically uh, turn to gold and they're super fragile and fall apart. And so in this performance piece, they're used, I'm, I'm thinking about how monuments, like again, I'm like, oh, I'm making these loops, how monuments in and of themselves don't have to be high. So we build a 64 brick monument in a circle and me and four other black, uh, three other black performers have this conversation where we turn inward and have a dialogue about performance and blackness at the Museum of Contemporary Art. And it's not about like performing for the audience. Like we did that. So the cool down is like for us and it's a part of the performance. Um, and thinking about how other monuments, basically the, the thing was falling apart, the sort of memorial monument. And it had this core of like 1200 bricks. So I took all of them. Um, and in my mind, it's a bit like my, um, it's a bit, it's, it's a bit like the mattress work, honestly, like inherently in these bricks, they have seen an entire history of the AIDS crisis that we cannot see, but in their degradation, they hold inside of them. And what does it mean to bring new life to that? And in many ways, code it and encrust it and sort of put queer history in it and also make it more fragile at the same time. And then to also use that as a, as a way to build something with people who you care about. We're gonna skip video. Um, we're kind of coming to a close. We've got like 20 more slides, so everyone, I know I talk a lot, but I was trying to keep it to an hour. So we still have 15 minutes. <laughs> um, I, I pull a lot from black feminist scholarship. It's really important to me. I find it to be on the cutting edge of thought. Uh, Christina Sharp, in the wake on being in blackness, I returned to many times. There's this page, I think it's page 18. In short, she says, I mean, wake work to be more of inciting and rupturing this epistemy with our known lived and unimaginable lives or imaginable lives. And I love this slash because there's this thing here where we're playing on what we can imagine for ourselves and the fact that what we imagine for ourselves feels unimaginable as black people sometimes. And I'm trying my hardest in my, in my life to just imagine that I could be anything I wanted to be. 
And that feels, that feels like really radical. <laughs> it feels really radical not to shrink yourself. It feels really radical not to feel like I have to be a photographer or just a professor or anything, or just a basketball player. I've always thought I could be more or anything I wanted to be. If I wanted to go to a different country, I've always said, there's a way you could make that happen. It's other people who tell me I can't do that. And so when I when I read this, I really thought about like, wow, like what is it that I have not imagined for myself and others? So um, Sarah, you spent a lot of time in New Orleans. This photograph is taken on Lincoln Beach. Uh, Lincoln Beach in many ways was like the first beach built for black people. Um, at the moment, and I know the city, last time I checked in 2022 was doing some restoration measures. Uh, it had fallen into disarray. Um, and it's where a lot of queer folks go to hang out and just kick it. And now it's near a neighborhood that isn't doing so well. Like there's a lot of reasons why it's like a thing that you avoid, but like those are where queer people go. And so uh, oftentimes when I work with people in my practice, it's just really people I meet in bars. And I met Frederick and Linnell who shows up in a later photograph. And Frederick had said that he'd never worn a dress and he wanted the opportunity to do that. And I said, well, like, let's imagine what that would be like for you. Like it seemed unimaginable because he'd never done it. And so then taking these photographs and oftentimes the photographs are happening again, just like documentation. It's just like, we're going to Lincoln Beach for four to six hours. We're going to get stoned. We're going to hang out. We're going to spend time together and learn more about each other because I'm just visiting New Orleans. Could we, can I bring my camera? And like, can you try on a dress once or twice? And like, let's just navigate what that process is like between all of us. Um, they become ways for me to meet people, for me to engage with people for me to think about my body in relationship to them. Are they staring at me? Are they staring beyond the camera? Um, I am always thinking about movement in the work. And I'm always thinking about how I'm adding to the archive and pulling from other archives. Uh, these are images um, from the city archives, municipal government photo collection in New Orleans. Uh, they're from Jim Crow era and I really wanted to find photographs of black people existing happily during Jim Crow even, because we have all the images of how difficult it was, how horrible it was, how destructive it was. But I knew that black people were trying to just rest and enjoy themselves beyond that. I wanted to have images of that too. So this is another way I'm thinking about photography. What can I turn it into? So I turned it into fabric. I made patterns with images of black people experiencing joy in times when it was denied to them. And then uh, this photo is out of sequence. This is the now that should have come a little bit earlier. But then I make performances in which people wear those garments and those and that sort of space in which the now the current comes in the, con the, the contemporary body comes into context with the history and literally wears it on its body sort of somatically. And then I build sculptural photographic pieces that sort of come into contact with that history and bring them together. The sand taken from, like I've literally excavated all these beaches and brought them to Chicago to exhibit this work. The objects inside sort of are these um, knowledge smithing objects uh, that really are reminiscent of my childhood toys, um, but, in, but also sort of give space for play. And so this performance happens inside of it. Uh, uh, um, Mirroring garments taken from the photograph, act of boyhood, divination, negation of sight. Imaginary beings perform in three acts, a repeating generative durational movement. Performers spend an hour inside of the sculpture rehearsing play, rest, and sexual exploration. The performers exit sandbox and enter gallery space, performing knowledge gain from the first hour of rehearsal. In the next act, the performers return to the sandbox and discuss how to better develop performance. Questions of comfort are brought up, as well as consent to certain actions throughout the performance. Performers playfully laugh and develop a closeness throughout. Performers evoke leisure, embrace, and sleep physically laying down in the sandbox. This is considered another type of active, uh, activism, space for Black queer bodies to rest and be renewed. And so I also, like in the process of working, again, as like a male body, like when I'm asking people who may not identify like with my same gender or they're trans or they're non-conforming to be in my performances, I tend to create rough rubrics for how I think the performance should go, almost like a solo wit, and then allow the performers to decide themselves how they want to navigate 
the performance. And so there's a way that the work becomes generative again of a type of collaboration that doesn't press upon it. The consent is that we agree that here is the rubric and that if you feel like you need to break from it, you can. If you feel like this doesn't meet your body, you can change the performance. And so this happened um, as, a, as an exhibition I had in Chicago. And then I build like my largest piece, which is like a 26 foot uh, uh, semi-constructed uh, tapestry piece that brings the toile pattern together, Tyvek, building materials, um, hair pieces, the documentation of the performance, uh, kinetic energy, because I'm really interested in movement, uh, into a single piece. And the piece was modular and could be zipped and unzipped. It was much like a garment that wasn't fully cre uh, finished. And I was really thinking about the construction of an idea and how not to finish the construction, but to put it in play in a certain way. Uh, it exhibits in Amsterdam in this um, exhibition. And it was really interesting hearing them talk about the piece because the sort of way race functions there is very different than how it functions here. And then I'm really interested in gesture in the body. Um, and so I started building these sort of like fabric pieces that gestured to my photographs. And then here is like, here's the end. This is what I'm working on right now. Uh, it's called Speculative Etymologies Firm, uh, sex firm, basically. And it's a speculative maroon, college, uh, maroon colony uh, that is built online and in real life that takes archival information and ethnographs sounds from different black folks and black experiences near uh, coastlines that are colonized, which is pretty much everywhere. So any place that touches the Atlantic Ocean in which black people may have migrated from. So I'm traveling to different countries and meeting other black and queer people. And it, this idea sort of comes a, a bit from Glissant and from Adrian Piper. So I'm thinking about multiplicity as liberty because in fact, we cannot speak for each other's experience. I do not live in Africa right now, but I'm interested in how African people seek pleasure and how queer African folks seek pleasure. And so versus deciding for myself or for anyone else what pleasure is, I'm, I built a questionnaire to query how they experience pleasure and to document it and um, to sort of pay people and compensate people to sort of give me this data that I'm using to build this larger project called Sex Fur. Um, and so I built sort of this interlocutor release form that goes along with it. Sex Firm integrates co-performance ethnography with critical research, anthropology, and social engagement to explore black sexual freedoms through the lens of sex, sexuality, gender, and interdisciplinary studies. The project creates points of engagement and interventions into the ever-evolving physical and digital black diasporic archive by blending the oral, visual, and material histories of Southern black folks through the use of contemporary technology Sex Firm performs alongside participants in a collaborative effort to affirm Southern Black folks as an under-theorized and misrepresented population and redefines our contribution to sexual cultures. Sex Firm acts as a living maroon community that along with participants explores the various potentialities of inhabiting an uncontested, sexually liberated Black society. And it's also, I'm taking from Adrian, uh, Audre Lord, who's thinking about the, erot the use of the er erotic pleasure and how pleasure could be Pleasure could be like cooking. Pleasure can be sex. Pleasure can also be laying and having quiet time to yourself. Pleasure can exist in so many different ways. So why define pleasure when you can create an archive of pleasure from a variety of people so that other people can see this archive and go, oh, I can experience pleasure this way. Um, so that's what I'm working on right now. It consists of photographs. I've called it American Intimacies. I've called it Sex Firm. It really depends on what it is. I've taken film. These are my childhood friends. Um, redoing Steve McQueen's Bear, uh, reperforming it in New Orleans. These are the photographs of uh, Jalen, someone I met in New Orleans. We have conversations. The ethnographs are recorded. They're fed back into the work and sort of use machine learning and gestural adversarial networks, which is pretty contemporary technology that sort of takes in data points and then outputs a different data point. And so also thinking about how like you can compress multiple sonic or arias of pleasure and then see what comes out of it. Just other photographs. This is Douglas who I met in New Orleans. This is the Material Life Archive. It's basically an archive full of uh, 
vernacular photography and photographs from the past. Um, some of it is also sexual pleasure material. And so I take black queer folks inside of the archive and have their bodies actually integrate into the archive and we photograph inside of it. This is Malcolm Peacock, who's a performance and interdisciplinary artist. We did a studio visit, we spent time in New Orleans and we documented some of the process. This will be a part of Sex Firm as well. This is me in a shower. This is just somatics. Um, me um, moisturizing somebody who, who said they would find pleasure in that. And then ultimately, uh, the work sort of exists, hopefully. Um, I just applied to funding at RISD to sort of develop it further into sort of an interactive website. Um, there are two artists, Basil Abbas and Ruan, who were close friends and they created this project at the DIA, um, which is still on the website you can go to. I think it's called May Amnesia Never Kiss You on the Lips or on the Mouth. And basically it's an interactive website that talks about migration journey. Uh, they're Palestinian. Um, and I think about sex firm in relationship to that work. And so uh, I'm really inspired by this work and we know each other. And so I reached out to them and it's like, hey, I wanna build this website for this project. I need more funding, how does this work? So this is the larger scale piece. And um, it's grown a lot. Last summer at the Camargo Foundation is when I began expanding it across multiple continents. Here's the pleasure questionnaire. It's in French and it's in English and I will be working hopefully with a translator to make it into a lot of different other languages that I do not personally speak. Uh, it's very interesting to work on large scale sort of social practice projects when you yourself like, I can't speak 30 languages. So then you know you need funds to get a translator. And so I'm just trying to think big and imagine larger for myself. Right now, it's sitting on a hard drive and actually this is what I'm working on while I'm here is going through 800 gigabytes of data uh, and sort of going through it and starting to figure out what's going to go on the interactive website, um, reaching out to more people in different countries to have a dialogue about how they can contribute and building uh, partnerships with different organizations around the world who might be interested in this research. Uh, this is sort of my work put over um, another installation by Basel and Ruan, and this is just an idea of how I could see Sex Firm existing in the world as sort of this interactive website. Thanks. Any questions for Derek? Thank you, Derek. Yeah, that was a lot. So if you need a second to ask your question. I actually have a question. Okay. Uh, I rarely ask questions. Uh, first, thank you. I was really uh, enlightening. I appreciate that. Uh, also, if you feel like a slacker, uh, it's an incredible. Uh, my question is um, about audience and uh, your work and you seem profoundly generous and uh, thanks. And there is a uh, such a attention to community collaboration, public performance, and I'm curious how you think about audience and accessibility from different types of people and. Uh, that's an excellent question. It's interesting, like, trying to believe in some of the things you tell your students, because they sound good. Like, I always say, I want to be decolonial in theory and practice. And I, the question that comes up in grad school or undergrad all the time is, like, who's the work for? And I always think the real question is, like, who's the work meant to protect? Like, who, who do you want to find safety in the work that you create? That's how I usually think about it. And there's a, the, the exhibition Gravity Pleasure Switchback had another really, really gorgeous neon piece in it that I didn't show. It was red and it was blue. And the, hey pup. Um, and it was programmed to look like it was about to fail. Like the potential was that it would go out, but that it would never go out. What it ended up looking like is police lights. And so in the center of Chicago, in a community that I really care about, I was not gonna show a piece that had flashing police lights in an exhibition space. And so I changed the piece an hour before the exhibition, right? And it was really like, that's what I think about when I make work. 
And I think it's also the location you are. Like I will show different types of work in different types of locations. Sometimes when it's in a community center, the work is different. Um, but we, when I had that, um, the sort of symposiums that were happening at RISD, we did two of them. And uh, Juliana Huxable came, um, Brontes Purnell, who is a friend and just like brilliant and wacky and kooky and amazing. But he said something that really set with me. I don't think it was exactly in these words, but he said, I really want my audience to be conflicted. Like my audience is a conflicted person because I, I don't want the work to, like the work is to protect black folks. Like I want those, and not all black folks. <laughs> And there are going to be some straight black men who are like, what the fuck is happening? You know, but like other queer, weird, academic -y peoples, in some cases, the work is just for them, you know, and in other ways, the work is really conflicted. And actually, I think it's really easy to get into for, for anyone. Like, that's what I think in my head. I go like, oh, anyone has has can have a thought about the color blue. Like they may not need to know the entire history of indigo, but maybe they'll go Google and gain some information. They may not know about the history of palm oil soap or palm oil and how it affected the entire economy of France. But like maybe through my work, they'll have access to it. But the people who know like Caribbean black folks who are queer in France, like I want them to be like, I know what you're doing. You know, that's kind of how I think about it. Can you explain just a little bit about that technology you were talking about? Like input, different data points, and outcomes, something else, completely. Yeah. Break it down just a I, I guess I didn't not just show video, but I want to show this to someone sometimes. Basically, so um, I was at the Bemis residency where 11 days and I ruptured my Achilles, but we had this really amazing seminar about gestural adversarial networks, which is basically like a machine learning structure that you can input. You could like input multiple points against other types of data sets. So like uh, I want to input an apple. I don't want it to output as this thing. And then when you put in a thousand apples, it will make an apple. But like, let's say you don't have it, like a thousand is not enough. You need a hundred thousand. So instead it tries to fill in data where there is a lack of information. So like how I've been using it in some other work is like actually using small archives that are big, like. 2,000, but not 20,000. And then watching the images merge and fall apart as they merge at the same time. And so I'm really interested in how you might then create like a black GAN or a black machine learned mid journey. What might that look like in a place where like the rights of black people are going to be even infringed upon on the internet as we build digital space? which is now being colonized, what might it look like to create a technology that uses black archive? So I think that's, I'm trying to figure that out while I'm here, but is it that I start going to like the Smithsonian or other larger museums and saying like, hey, can I have access to your archive? Can I use this to put into this sort of thing? And then whatever it outputs, it outputs, you know? And then I use that data to make the work, you know? But that's kind of how it is. It's like being able to take an archive or anything really, and then input it, and then it will, you, you run it, off of a server because it takes a lot of server. So then I also have to think about, I don't have to think about, but I choose to think about how that affects the environment, right? Like all those cables are underneath the ocean, the same ocean that my ancestors died on the way here. How has that become a part of the work? You know, we never talk about if 10% if of the population is black and queer. We never talk about how many queer black folks, trans folks died. Like, during the transatlantic slave trade. Like we never talk about that. And so I'm interested in how the work that I'm making can maybe use machine learning or contemporary technology to have some type of dialogue about it that would be photographic, but I don't, uh, that can't really be filled in. So they just become speculative ideas. And I think actually we often feel, I think the, the gaze, or we talk about the white gaze a lot, but it asks you to substantiate your existence or prove prove there were queer people who died. I'm like, I don't have to prove, like statistically it would be impossible, <laughs> you know? And so sometimes I'm like, well, well, why not just speculate? Why not just build speculative future work and then let people be like, because the people who are going to be naysayers are going to be naysayers either way. And I think that's, that goes back to like, who's the work for? kind of conversation like if the work is consistently trying to like prove itself 
to a majority eye, it kind of like can't do the work it's trying to do, you know? So like, I know I'm going to lose some people some places when I make semen photographs. Like I know like people are going to be like, ah, you know, but I'm not doing it to scare them. It actually feels really normal for me because it's something I enjoy. It's like sex. <laughs> but what comes out of it is actually art for me, you know, and people really struggle with like the peculiarities, not the intricacies and how interdisciplinary the work is or how like interstitched some of these ideas are. Are there any online questions? No, cool, <laughs> cool. Thank you so much. Uh, I think it's I think it's February thirteenth at Mass Art. This will change a little bit, I think. But um, even if after this ends, there's some feedback. Like I know I talk fast. I know I have really bad anxiety. So I'm like. You know, I'm like a person who is also very aware that I'm trying to grow as a human. So feel free to ask or suggest anything. Okay. Thank Thanks. You. Thank you.